Hello and welcome to a special edition of The Politics Show. Nominations have closed for the Assembly elections, with 218 candidates competing for 108 seats on the Hill. Almost a 50% chance of winning if positions were decided by the flick of a coin. But they're not, of course. And some candidates are fighting against the odds to make it to Stormont. And like everything else these days, there's a wider choice on offer. On today's programme, we meet some of those smaller parties that are fighting for your votes on May the 5th. And they come face to face with a panel of interested voters who will quiz them on what they would do if they were elected. OK, I mean, Keith Harbison, the TUV, it's a difficulty for you in this election, the fact that orange and green isn't the main thing, the fact that perhaps discontent uh, with Stormont and its structures isn't uh, at the forefront of this campaign because you'd want to make it such. Uh, well, I completely disagree. Um, the TUV have never stood on an orange and green ticket. The TUV have continually stood to improve the system that we have, and that is very much the floor. This is what we're finding on the doors, Jim. People are dissatisfied. You look at the OFM-DFM report, 75% of people in this country have said that they do not feel the last assembly delivered for them. So people want better services. And until we sort of realign the system where we take it away from what is essentially the most sectarian thing that we have in this country, bringing the largest parties from each side, force them together in a mandatory coalition saying you must make this work, until we can find voluntary coalition on an agreed programme for government, we will never be able to address the core issues that need dealt with. Now let's go to our panel of voters who are keen to have their questions answered by the parties that are here today. And our first question is from Seamus Searson, who is a representative of teachers' unions. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my question is, the schools and the school support services are facing tremendous cuts over the next four years. What is your party going to put forward to protect the front line the teachers in the schools, class sizes, and at the same time, raise standards. Keith Harbertson, can you do anything about frontline jobs in education if you don't have the money? Well, uh, with regards to the money, as has already been alluded to by Henry, uh, it's important that we do go back to the Westminster government and we do ask for a review of the Barnet formula. Because Is that not a danger of uh, ending up with less money? Uh, no, I don't believe so, because I don't believe the Barnet formula takes into account the socioeconomic conditions that exist in Northern Ireland. But notwithstanding that, even with the budget we have, much more can be done. You know, Stormont wastes a phenomenal amount of money within a four-year assembly. We've seen 400 million go north-south bodies, which appear to produce little more than a photo call and a lunch. We have had 10 million wasted in local government reform that wasn't implemented. We have had 10 million sent to ANISA, which is yet to be implemented. You, all those things, th that money can be cut back. Stormont itself as a system needs to be trimmed and uh, the, the bureaucracy limited. We are talking about uh, a shift from public sector to private sector. All that will assist in creating more money. So you want to do, just to be clear, the opposite of perhaps what Eamon McCann is suggesting. You want pri the private sector to get more involved to increase efficiency, as you would see it. Absolutely. I think there's great potential because that then feeds through the rest of society by job creation and things such as that. But in relation to education, we've seen a minister who's remained unaccountable, who has wasted within her own department. So I think there's much in the next assembly okay. that can be done to correct the last four years. Well, we might return to this issue uh, in a wider context later, but specifically mm -hmm. on the older people, uh, Keith Harbinson, uh, can you offer uh, any uh, new measures that will benefit them? Well, uh, something we constantly hear on the doorsteps is exactly what has been raised today. The people who have been prudent during their lifetime, who have been brought up in a generation where you put something by for a rainy day, are now being heavily penalised against because they have taken that responsibility. Is that approach. really the case, or did the previous generation just spend the inheritance uh, of the younger people coming through? No, I don't think so. I think you know the previous generation were told that you had to put something by, you get your own home, and unfortunately we are living in a situation now where we are getting a rapidly aging population, and it is where I am looking to the future because with so much unemployment, so many young people not able to get jobs, you have to ask the question, where is the revenue coming on tax raising powers to facilitate and aid uh, elderly people as they move into their retirement? The retirement age, and as I said, is increasing, so therefore there's going to be a greater onus on people to work longer. Uh, which then probably uh, will feed through naturally that any perceived benefits such as free travel and things like that, the age will be driven up eventually as well and that. Well, Keith Harbinson, the TUV, uh, would see itself as a fairly right-wing uh, party, a uh, free market uh, party. Why are you sceptical about corporation tax? Well, we believe the cut in corporation tax down to uh, an equivalent level with the Republic of Ireland has been taken on a purely political decision. Um, the UK government are proposing a corporation tax across the other regions of the UK, but on a much smaller scale. We're saying if it's good enough for them, it's good enough uh, for us. We have to remain, I believe, as part of the United Kingdom with the sixth largest economy in the world. Uh, that is where our future lies. 
Any so just to be clear, do you think it's been introduced for political reasons or are you just opposing it for political reasons? No, no, it's been reduced for political reasons because, as I've outlined, there's no basis on which this will show any further sustained growth here than any other region within the UK. But what it does mean, it undermines our fiscal unity within the UK because this is the start of probably a, the beginning of a, a slippery slope. Uh, there will be other tax raising powers, other tax deviation. That disparity weakens our strength of the union. But the other thing with the reduction of corporation tax to the proposed level will mean a 300 million reduction plus in the block grant. Now, we have had a budget proposed which is vacu vacuous in, in its detail. It doesn't provide specifics. But even at that, we had two executive ministers breaking the ministerial code and voting against it because okay. they simply couldn't agree the cuts they have to now, never mind a well, further 300 million. Let me put it another stage. Let me get uh, a question now from uh, Brett Cullingham. And Brett, you're a former Coast Guard. Yes, Jim. Thank you. Some aspects of uh, public services have already been addressed, but I would look to, like to look at a specific area. During any major maritime incident, all the emergency services of Northern Ireland will work closely together to ensure a successful search and rescue um, outcome. Now, with the cuts that are proposed, um, some of these facilities might not be there in the future. What I would like, if the candidates could assure me that uh, these resources uh, will be fully funded uh, to meet their commitment in the future. Goal. It's easy though, Keith Harman said, isn't it, to talk about slashing uh, managers in the health service, but frankly, uh, we need managers to get things done too. Absolutely, uh, but you look historically on the level of management that we had and the rate of that management and the remuneration and the health service worked possibly more efficiently than what it does today, so it certainly needs examination, but whenever we talk about efficiencies within the assembly, we talk about efficiencies right across the board and we're talking about uh, the assembly essentially wasting money, you know, it's already been said about money that was sent back from the block grant that wasn't used, uh, money that is used for frugal, uh, or sorry, uh, you know, over elaborate um, structures uh, and sort of hobby horses of ministers um, pursuing narrow ideological agendas, all that has to be addressed. If we address those right across the board, we then will find ourselves with hundreds of millions, if not billions extra in the pot that can be used, and let's break it down. This gentleman is talking about emergency services that save lives. Of course, this has to be a number one priority for the country to look at, and we must maintain those as best we can. So well, let's go back to our, our panel. Uh, sure. And Alison Miller, uh, you're with NIPSA, and of course, uh, you're against the cuts uh, too. What do you want to ask the politicians? Uh, will you support the campaign by the trade unions to oppose the pension increases planned by the UK government, and which would be applicable here in Northern Ireland? Uh, Keith Harbert. Well, I firmly believe that our public sector does need to be examined. You know, whenever you have approximately 60% of our population working within the public sector remit, it's far too top heavy. And whenever we reach a situation of uh, uh, the economic climate that we have today in recession, it makes it exceedingly difficult for us to climb back out of that. We're the only region within the United Kingdom who has yet to show any sign of economic recovery. But I believe that has to be managed accordingly. I believe that there should not be cuts, um, and it feeds right down but through you into the service. You're, you want to be, be managed until but, that can be managed. But you don't want to touch the pensions. No, it has to be, there has to be a capacity within the private sector to absorb that. If that capacity exists to absorb that transfer, then pensions will not need to be touched. Okay, well, let's hear from uh, our last uh, panelist, uh, Ken Sharp. You're a small <laughs> business uh, owner. Uh, what's your concern? Well, we've heard various ways uh, of talk about raising money, and road service are planning to raise money by introducing on-street car parking charges in a lot of towns around Northern Ireland thus handing the out-of-town shopping centres a further advantage against small businesses based in towns um, where they've got their acres of free car parking. So really it's the panel's opinion on uh, the parking charges specifically, but the town centres of small towns more generally. Keith Harbins. Yeah, no, I, I wholly agree with that. You know, we already see fairly high levels in our major towns uh, in respect of on-street parking, and that is a, a major disadvantage. But uh, I come back to the point that I've made before, our private wealth creating sector in this country lags far behind the rest of the United Kingdom and that's really a legacy of 40 years of terrorist violence here whenever the heart was blown clean out of it. But that imbalance needs addressed because until we can get down to that, until we can encourage a private sector which means business growth right across the board through the private sector which then feeds through into higher tax raising, more social welfare, more money there to do what needs to be done and all those issues that have been addressed today, that's the key. So therefore anything that's going to diminish, we already see uh, empty units across every town. Um, the, the so you're against the parking charges? Yes, I, I feel that uh, anything that's going to be meaning more businesses closing is going to heap an even bigger um, incumbents upon the taxpayer. So therefore anything that can be done to assist that should be done. Uh, are you in favor?